Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Today on Earth Focus, the environmental issues that will shape China's future with Jonathan Watts, author of When a Billion Chinese Jump. Coming up on Earth Focus. Jonathan Watts is the Asia environmental correspondent for The Guardian, one of the UK's leading newspapers. He recently traveled more than 100,000 miles across China to look at the state of the environment. He shares his insights with Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson. Jonathan Watts, you've written a book called When a Billion Chinese Jump. Where did you get this title about a billion Chinese jumping? I chose this as a title for two reasons. One, because I think it shows that fears of China can be irrational, because it's big, because it's the other, because it's far away and unknowable. But also because there is a very real reason to be concerned about China, which is not that it's becoming further away from us, but it's actually becoming more like us and that we are the problem. Uh, we, with our unsustainable living standards and lifestyle and consumption habits, we are the problem. So a billion people in rich countries have already made the jump. Uh, there are several billion more lining up behind China to make the jump. And China's right there in the middle at the potential tipping point. You spent seven years in China. You saw all sorts of environmental degradation. What was the worst of it? You visit uh, cancer villages. There's a, there's a woman uh, I met called uh, Jiang Gumei, um, and she, she lives in a village in Yunnan province, and she has uh, cancer, and she's uh, undergoing chemotherapy. She believes her cancer has been caused by the chemical factory on the edge of her village. Um, and her doctor believes it's because of the chemical factory, that there are more and more cases of cancer in the village. And the local environmental official says, well, we know that there are problems with the discharges from these factories, but they do it at night when we're not looking, and they have secret pipes, so it's really hard to catch them. Um, so that's the first story, I would say. The second is more to do with the natural world and a loss of biodiversity, um, a loss of color, of variety. The biggest victim, or at least the highest profile victim, was the Baiji dolphin the Yangtze River dolphin. This is a, a species that's been on Earth for 20 million years, it used to be worshipped by mankind, a freshwater dolphin, and it's squinty-eyed, long nose, um, cute little thing. Um, its numbers have declined precipitously over the past few decades, uh, partly because of river traffic, uh, partly because of pollution, partly because of very irresponsible fishing uh, practices, such as using electricity, using explosives to fish. You, your book describes a China full of smoke and haze, and it has now reached the point of being the world's largest emitter of CO2, which is the greenhouse gas scientists believe is causing global warming. Um, and it's going to get worse in China, the emissions problem. Have we already gone over the brink? I would say there, there, is, there are signs that people are trying to change direction. And within China, I would say there are very strong signs that a lot of people are trying to change direction. And in a sense, that's the bright side of the crisis. When you have a very bad crisis, you have to do something or you perish. Uh, so China cannot just outsource its problems to other countries to this, in the same way that Europe and the United States and Japan and other countries have outsourced their high polluting, energy intensive, carbon emitting interest, industries. Um, it's, it's all happening within China at the moment. Every, pretty much every environmental problem you can think of. The government, have, is, they are aware of it. This isn't, this, these are not foolish people. You have a, a president who's a hydro engineer, Hu Jintao. You have a, a prime minister who is a geologist, Wen Jiabao. So you have experts on water and experts on, on the earth. They're very well aware of what's happening. They're not sticking their heads into the ground like ostriches. 
but none of those Chinese leaders wants to get in the way of growth. The overriding priority of the Chinese Communist Party is stability. Until now, that means growth, and pretty much only growth. As long as you can keep the economy growing, you will have a stable nation, you can rule that country, it's not going to fall apart. But if the environment starts to become a threat to stability, which I think it has, and you see a lot of protests related to the environment in China. We don't know exactly how many because the government stopped releasing figures, but I've certainly seen the aftermath of several large protests. And it, so it is a social issue we're talking about here. It's a security issue we're talking about here. We're not just talking about clean water and clean air and a pretty landscape. Although economic growth remains the priority and the most important thing for maintaining stability, the environment is an increasingly large factor. And so what you're seeing is uh, a mix, a policy mix. It is still economy first, but trying to bring in more and more uh, environmental considerations. Are the Chinese people aware of the threat to their food supplies as a result of global warming? First of all, it's definitely a concern because China is a country where, within living memory, there was an appalling famine that killed 20 to 40 million people. Uh, so food security is very, very important. However, uh, cities are expanding. Uh, they're eating into farmland. Uh, and in some cases, the quality of the soil is degrading because of pollution or because of excessive use of fertilizer or because of expanding deserts. So there's this constant battle to try to maintain uh, enough food to feed the nation or to import enough food to feed the nation. Um, but this is a real concern and there are a number of challenges. If temperatures continue to rise, that will increase the likelihood of deserts expanding and eating into more land. Um, it could change crop yields uh, in some areas for the, for the better, in some areas for the worse. Um, there are problems in, in Xinjiang in particular. The, the glacier meltwater is essential for the cities there and for irrigation. Um, and what you're seeing is that the rate at which those glaciers are melting has in many cases accelerated. So in the short term, you get a water boom. You get a kind of a bonus, but it's, it's a deceptive because this will last as long as the glacier lasts. And if the glacier's not kind of being replenished to the same level that it, w that it used to be, um, it's gonna run down and your water boom is gonna turn into a water bust. Uh, and so just recently, the government has announced that it plans to build a pipe all the way across China to take water from the sea that will be desalinated and pipe it all the way across to the far side of China. That's a very long way. That's a very expensive project. Uh, and I think that shows the level of desperation uh, with regard to water. Water is China's biggest problem right now. Even if China pursues a new environmentally conscious course, it is also planning to continue all of its emissions and add to them, isn't it? China will, in, will, will continue to, uh, to emit more carbon for, at the very least, another decade, and probably another two or three decades. Um, so I, I think that's inevitable, because the only way you could stop that is to say, well, you, you can't improve your living standards. And you can't say that to China. I mean, that, that was so incredibly unreasonable when they're still so far so much below uh, the, the, the standards in the Western world. So the key at the moment is for China to grow as efficiently as possible. So there is as little waste as possible. The increase is kept to the lowest possible level. And to see us some point in the future, uh, a time when those carbon emissions will peak and when the use of other types of energy can start to overtake them. And of course, at the same time, that will require international cooperation. It will require sacrifices uh, by, by richer nations as well. Um, uh, uh, but that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. So the Chinese jump into industrialization and growth really could knock the world off its axis. <laughs> it will make the world a very hot place. We might well stay where we are, but it might not be such a nice place to be. Jonathan Watts, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.
Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world. To learn more, visit linktv.org.